We thank the Lord for the opportunity to meet again today as we continue our ongoing study on course 307, the fivefold apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. And today we're now in lesson 36. We are now in the epilogue series. We finish analyzing the office of apostle, office of prophet, office of evangelist, office of pastor, office of teacher. And now we began to do the epilogue. Eight lessons will make up the epilogue. It's going to be a section on its own. And part of the purpose of the epilogue is to reiterate some of things that have been said in this long course. We are now in about 400 and something pages. Okay, and so some of things that were said, so that lest we forget, we now begin to reiterate them, flesh them up, add some, you know, value to them, so that by the time we finish this course, the key truths that have been discussed in this large volume would have been, you know, reiterated and so they can be fresh in the mind. So today, in lesson 36, we want to discuss the grand purpose of the fivefold is manifestation of the kingdom church. The church that has embraced Yeshua as head, as owner, as everything. Now let's pray. Father in heaven, by your spirit, serve us the measure of truth we need today in this lesson to come to a better appreciation of the purpose of the fivefold. Have your way, O Lord. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. In fact, it's one of the recurring three themes of this course that the kingdom church is built by Yeshua. He is the head of the church. And the Bible says in Matthew 16, 18, I saw unto you that Peter, <clears throat> when he was you know, having that dialogue at Caesarea Philippi, he says, upon this rock, not Peter, <laughs> Peter is a human being, upon this rock, which rock? Upon the revelation of his divinity that Peter had just uttered, upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Upon that reality that Elohim in Yeshua was made flesh, to pay the price for the sins of humanity. And all who believe, it doesn't matter how deep the sin is, how wide it is, it doesn't matter how blood-stained the hands are, believing changes the equation. We're coming to him who is the head. We're coming to his body. And so that is why the Lord didn't want to leave this to chance, that he had to recruit that man who was an enemy of the gospel in Acts chapter 9, verse 1 to 27. Yeshua personally recruited Paul the apostle and committed unto him a detailed description of the church, what it is, how it should operate, how Satan will fight it, an understanding of his timeline, and what it will be like at his return. You know, in Ephesians 5, 26, 27, a church without spot or wrinkle or other such thing. And there's no way any way can engage in genuine New Testament ministry without a proper understanding of the Pauline epistles. Men and brethren, of them, these ones, you know, carry their weight in gold at the epistle to the Romans. The extraordinary exposition of grace, what it is, and how it operates, and the means through which it's operated. First and second Corinthians that have so much about life, kingdom life, and that great description about the fact that the church is an organism of different body parts, active body parts in First Corinthians chapter twelve, wherein you know the the the, the every part of the body is supposed to be functional. And First Corinthians chapter thirteen about the power, the necessity of charity, uh, you know, central to everything we do in the kingdom. And then Galatians, that extraordinary, you know, exposition about our identity in the Lord and who is in us, and also about how grace trumps legalism. And then Ephesians again that describes the body of Yeshua. Colossians describe Yeshua the head and the body. Philippians, kingdom life. Colos uh, First and Second Timothy, instructions to a young minister about how to run the church and what are critical things 
about the church that should be known, the epistle to Titus, another you know, instruction to a young minister, the book of Hebrews, which of course, of all the potential authors, it is him most likely based on his antecedents. Now, central to the master plan of Yeshua for his church is that it will be led by the fivefold, five categories of office, gifts, and functions, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. And they are not to walk alone. Each of them is not permitted to walk alone. So there's no point saying you discover you're an apostle or a prophet or whatever. You run off on your own to be on your own. You lead the people into error. No. Wired into the fivefold is the, the tendency to know that without the other folds, we're not complete. So that synergy will take place. And when synergy takes place, there's an impartation that goes into the life of the saints and equips them to mature them to take their place as a royal priesthood, which is the outcome of what the fivefold does. The outcome of the fivefold is actually the manifestation of the royal priesthood, people who are called out of darkness into marvelous light, and they receive the grace to serve as priests and kings, you know, in the kingdom church. Men and brethren, and to each of the office gifts and functions, he released a measure of himself. They are not operating alone, as I said before, so that the church will not remain immature and inadequate. And I have time to read Ephesians 4, 11 to 16, and 1 Corinthians 12, 1 to 32, Romans 12, 1 to 8. So Yeshua deliberately made the concept of the fivefold a collective, lest preachers try to build human empires around their persons, around their personal charisma, or other specific gifts that they have. Each of the fivefold is therefore to receive a good understanding of who Yeshua is, you know, who he is, and his kingdom, and the church as his body. And in effect, the church of Yeshua will be inadequate and less than what it is, is ordained to be anywhere and anytime the fivefold is non-existent or dysfunctional where some of the fools are not available. That is why Satan went for the juggler, as we said in the last lesson. He went for the juggler in the 4th century, when the Roman Empire married the larger wing of the church that was tired of the non-return of Yeshua and tired of persecution. One of the first things that was done was to chuck the five food out and replace it with that organizational and hierarchical structure that is not organic, that is organizational, that makes room for competition, for strife, for uh, jealousy and envy and all that. And then, interestingly, the general Protestant community, since Martin Luther's Reformation in 1517, you know, till now, that's about five, five, around five years. What has it done? Basically, it has fallen for the bait in which ministries revolve around individuals, around not Yeshua. That's why you see today this Photoshop thing, every little thing, every little thing to eat, call or not. We need to do a poster with the Photoshop face of the man of God. Uh, we need to do a house of ceremony. We need to do that. The man of God projected into the psyche of the people. It's a psychological operation. So when you are dreaming, you don't dream of heaven or the mysteries of the kingdom. You dream of the man of God. And it becomes all in all. And the life of the people revolve around the man of uh, God. Men and brethren, to the glory of the Father, he preserved for himself throughout the dark ages of religion. He preserved the remnant. Romans chapter 11, verse Five. Even so, then at this present time, there there is a remnant according to the election of grace. It is the Father that preserved the remnant that have been carrying the truth throughout the generations. So, as we enter the closing chapter of this age, the enemy has struck again and created two new diversions, so to say, and they are predominant. One. We've mentioned it a number of times. Is the pseudo kingdom gospel that says preach preach the kingdom don't preach christ don't preach jesus preach the kingdom how can you preach a kingdom and live of the king how can you talk about the kingdom without the king that is what why it's called pseudo kingdom it's not real a lot of 
good sounding stuff, a lot of sound bites, but to the extent that the, their Christology is deficient, the, their knowledge of the person of Yeshua as very God, very man is deficient, it is a terrible, toxic doctrine. It is actually a fruit of Arianism. Arianism is the doctrine that also came up in the 14th century. An infamous priest at Alexandria, Egypt, called Arius, he propounded a theory that Yeshua is not divine. It's created. It's not divine. It's of, not of the same rank as the Father. You know, it's not. And that there's no such thing. And that man, you know, that strain of his theology still finding those who are finding it difficult to accept the reality of what the Bible says of Yeshua HaMoshem. The second strain of error that you find today is so popular that people don't even know it. It's called dominionalism. That is, this is the theology that the church is to take over this present world, dominate it. And by dominating it, the kingdom has come, so to say. <laughs> so we don't need to prepare for Yeshua. It's not often stated, but you really don't need to prepare for his return again. Just climb the mountains of society, get to the top of the society. There the kingdom has come because you are the, you are the representative of the kingdom. Hey, this is so interestingly invidious that many people do not even know because there is a lot of sound bites again. Things that look great and mighty and then they play on a few words and people don't know. They are being misled. So it's very important to know that both the pseudo kingdom movement and dominionalism, go and check the leadership. You find that they are averse to the fivefold. They don't talk about the fivefold. They don't. They don't. Check it. Men and brethren, certainly more dangerous than the original leaven of Babylon, these two have ensnared many spirit-filled saints who have relapsed into soul-based worship. They are now worshipping the Lord with their reason, with their emotion, with their suppositions. So many theologies that are spinning off the minds of men. They've set aside the true gospel of the kingdom as described in the gospel. They claim the Bible is not adequate to guide them. They've created a new gospel in which the Bible is severely twisted and distorted to mean what they want it to mean. The result is that many saints are seeking a false kingdom in which Yeshua is not the center and the circumference, a kingdom which is far greater than the king. That's their kingdom. So men and brethren will continue to say that danger locks when the fivefold is absent. What do we mean? When the fivefold is not there, as described in Ephesians 4, 11 to 16, don't just focus on 11 or 11 and 12 when I'm talking about the fivefold. Go all the way to verse 16, which shows the outcome that we come to a place where we know, we grow up, we're not easily tossed about by every wind of doctrine, we're not confused by people, and we are able to represent the king, grow up into him in all things, and then from there, we receive grace to speak the truth to one another in love and to begin to release and receive what is in other people. So when the fivefold is there, number one, the saints will be perfected to know who they are in Yeshua, who is in them. Number two, equip the saints to know their roles in the kingdom. Number three, enable the saints to play their assigned roles in building up or edifying the church. Number four, when the saints receive ministry from the fivefold, they come to a place of unity in faith, regardless of racial or ethnic backgrounds, socio social, socioeconomic status, age, gender, the congregations they are part of, or the location. Just one. You meet a brother in America, brother in Europe, brother in Africa, Asia. They speak the same language because they believe the same truth in the Holy Bible. They've been taught by those in the fivefold. They thus come into the knowledge of Yahweh, our Father. Then they go into the kingdom. Then they understand the church, as we described in the last lesson, and the lifestyle that believers are supposed to live on earth. Number five, the saints thus become mature and measure up to the fullness of his stature. When saints are fed by apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, they're so fed up, I mean, they are so built up, they are so matured, 
and they can measure to the fullness of his stature because they know whom they believe. They stand on him. They believe him. They trust him. Number six, with this development, immaturity is removed. The saints will no longer be tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine, sweet-sounding doctrines of devils and soulish inventions of men and women. They can discern those things. When they read a book, no matter how big the name of the author is, as they read the book, there's something in them that knows when they have met error. Something. There'll be an ouch in their spirit, man, because there's an antenna. The Lord builds into every sin to know when you are in something that is dangerous to your soul. Men and brethren, they can know. If they go to a conference, people are excited. They know when a man is in the spirit. And once he goes into the flesh to, for purpose of manipulating them, they begin to you know, they begin to discern that. They know where leaven is hidden. They able, they have an internal sensor. The Spirit of the Lord in them tells them when they have met somebody that is a little bit off. Number seven, saints who are thus built up will discern when preachers are also setting them up to milk them, whether promoting books or material or seeking money to finance their fancy ways, not kingdom purposes, raising finance just to fancy, to buy that kind of golden wristwatch, the new type of so so and so, all those things. And number eight, saints can mature to where they can freely receive and release all the gifts and callings for the mutual edification of the whole body. So you edify, you build up, you release to others and receive from them. So we discuss in this course the responsibility of ministers of the gospel. A true minister of the gospel, therefore, should prayerfully conduct, I mean, connect Farada. Or oh, Father, first and foremost, get to know your, do a spiritual audit of yourself. What are your gifts? Where are your callings? Where are your strengths? Where are your weaknesses? What are the things that will make the work the Lord gives to you complete? You know, when you do that, number one, then you prayerfully connect with and align in an interpersonal relationship with other ministers with gifts and callings you do not have for mutual edification, accountability, and support. Other ministers, pastors in the area, you can connect with them. Number two, be fully connected to any fellowship where you can tap into the full grace of Yeshua, evidenced by the ministry of those other fivefold office gifts which you don't have. And that's so important. And, you know, by being part of such a company of ministers who are faithful and through the word and his end time agenda, you are properly nourished individual as a leader. You are nourished. It's your responsibility to locate the, such ministers where they are, fellowships where they are. You know, there are so many ecumenical and religious gatherings where there's a danger to your soul because it's political unity. Okay, these are those that are going to be part of the one world religious system. When you see all this political unity type of uh, uh, organization, it doesn't matter whether you believe or not. Just if you mention the name of Jesus in your church documents, we are one. Oh, no. <laughs> we are not one. Many churches don't have Yeshua as Lord of, their, of, their, of themselves. So you look for, you prayerfully. There are. There is around you. Some it may not be popular, it may not be prominent, but around you there are some ministers' networks that have the kind of thing you need. And they have to, and if you can't find any, well, we offer you International Ministers Fellowship. By the grace of the Lord, go to look up the website www.imfministers.com and go and check it up. And we don't charge. For you to be part of IMF, we don't charge. This money is not an issue in that network. Everything is as you are led to support, you know, the, the, the growth of the chapter where you are. And so, number four, depending on your special specific needs, you may also align with, you know, a mentor. You prayerfully open. The Lord will show you one who has the grace to mentor you with the help of Holy Spirit into coming to the fullness of the stature of the Lord. Number five, ultimately, the best course of action is for you, if you're a pastor or an overseer, is for you to empower the saints in the congregation. Empower them through training. Teach, 
train, equip, activate, release. Empower them to discover their gifts and callings. And if through you, the fivefold can emerge. That's what we're doing. You know, we have a, I mean, a model that we believe is very practical and actionable. By the grace of the Lord, arise me to put an assembly out of London. And since the COVID, arise online church with our walls. That's just what we do. You know, inbuilt in the entire operation is a teach, train, equip, activate, release paradigm. And every few years, people finish their program. They are ordaining to ministry. When you're ordaining to ministry, you go to prove your ministry. After some time, if there's a fivefold gift there, office gift there, you are confirmed. And... You can choose the uh, d- deaconate uh, cohort and fulfill yourself in anything you are called. And so we, if you are a minister and you are not affiliated to anybody, you are just floating, you know, f- yeah, get in touch. Do the uh, global leadership internship program. You know what? Get with us. Take a period of time. Agreed. And as you begin to up interact with others, the grace in you is released, is unleashed, and then you can be confirmed in what you are called. Brothers and sisters, it's so important to also know that saints have responsibility. We discuss this in the course. A part of responsibility is to know that on the last day, every believer will give account of your life to the Lord. Your salvation, what did you do with it? The salvation you received freely? The providential care of the Father over your life? The gifts and callings that are in you, the Lord gave to you. You didn't discover them. You'd be like the one that took his gift, tied it, and hid it in the ground. You have no excuse. You can't tell us, oh, no, no, I don't know where I was. They don't tell us that you have gift and calling. No saint can plead ignorance because we all have access to the Bible, which is the divine manual of life. We all have access to the truth the Lord is releasing in these days. Nobody can blame me. You can't even blame your pastor. Pastor didn't tell me. So if pastor didn't tell you, then what happens? You now let you go because pastor didn't tell you. That's your excuse. No, they're not. So what should you do? Number one, by Holy Spirit's help and in prayer, use the Holy Word in Ephesians 4, 1 to 11 to 16. And materials like this cause, take it. You can finish the, this course one a day, a month, and about a month and about uh, fourteen days or thereabout, or a month and fifteen days actually thereabout. You finish this study. When you study, you'll be able to do something important for you, for your soul. Audit by the Spirit, your leader. Find out your leader by the Spirit, or are the gifts and callings that the Lord has made he or she to be. Why is it important to know that? Number two, if because if the church operates in a limited understanding of the fivefold, or is close to the fullness of the fivefold, the saint must ask Yeshua in prayer to guide you to other vessels to receive that which is missing in the local assembly. And this sounds radical. My brothers and sisters, this is actually the way of life. When I ask you to follow anybody, you see, no. Number three, through media such as Facebook and other social media or TV and other online platforms, you can f- the Lord can actually fill you up with what is missing in the local assembly. The Lord can give you, you know, speak into your life what is missing. But you need great discernment. So you do not fall for wolves in sheep's clothing. That's why you need to rely on Holy Spirit. You don't allow your carnal senses to, to carry you out because they can deceive you. Number four, the point is this. No saint should sit easy in a place where she, he or she is not receiving training, is not being equipped, is not being activated in the gifts of Holy Spirit. You've been in church for 20 years. You don't know your gift. You don't know what a spiritual gift is. You don't know your calling. And there is no opportunity, no possibility, because where you are, they run a laity and clergy system. Clergy is one or two or three people called who wear special robe. And your job is to come and be a consumer of the anointing on them. And you have nothing to do other than to bring money for tithe and offering. Men and brethren, you owe yourself a responsibility to know that that shall not be your portion. So, number five, 
if a local assembly or leader is totally closed to or opposed to the ministry of the fivefold, that leader loses the moral right to lead the remnant sins. You know what? It's, I mean, somebody may not know that's a different thing. And within the limit of what he or she knows, you find great liberty. You can grow. You can be what you can exercise yourself. That is okay. That's okay. The Lord can help such a person with intercession. But what is not okay if somebody tells you, I don't believe in the fivefold. It's for the old time. It's not for now. And make such wild claims. You know what? You don't have to argue. You don't have to debate. The person I just told you, I'm not qualified to speak into your life. So what do you do? You have a responsibility not to finance error. Not to finance something that totally rejects what the Lord has provided. So what do you do? Gently, no drama, disengage from such a place because your gift and calling will die with time. In other words, they will atrophy, be not used. So you have no business financing such a place, putting money there, promoting such a place. No, because what will be going on there is going to be what we call trading in souls. And Revelation 18 verse 4 the Bible says, Come out from her, my people. Don't be partaker of our sins, that you receive not of our pigs. For our sins have come up to heaven, and Elohim must remember her iniquities. That's what Babylon does, and that is manifestation of Babylon. Rejection of the fivefold outrightly is manifestation of mystery Babylon, which is stated in Revelation chapter 17. And then, men and brethren, so the inconvenient questions need to be asked. Since the day of Pentecost and since the Pauline epistles were given, there are two questions that we can ask. Number one, in reality, is rejection of any, some, or all of the ascension of his gifts, the fivefold gifts, is it a rejection of Yeshua himself? The answer is a resounding yes. It's a rejection of Yeshua. If you reject what he provided for perfection of his church, you are rejecting him. Number two question, can any part or unit of the church be perfected if it operates outside the impartation of any, some, or all the fivefold? The answer is no. No fivefold, no perfection. That's the reality of, of what things are like. It's that serious. It's not, this is not a boss war. This is not for joke. This is for real. The fivefold is Yeshua's provision for perfection of his church, for maturation of his church, for equipping of his church so that his church can be what he wants it to be. So by way of assignment, first, would you kindly share this video with friends and family and let people, let the discussions begin. Let, let us go back to the Bible challenge people. Get to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Get to Romans chapter 12, 1 to 8. Get to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 7, all the way to verse 11, all the way to verse 16. Let's get to discuss these things. And of course, writings like that of Peter in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10 and 11. So having said that, let's now take some assignments. Number one, briefly mention the key things a minister should do in response to understanding the truth of the absolute necessity of the fivefold. What should a minister do when your eyes are open to the reality that the fivefold is nece very necessary? Number two, mention the key things an individual saint who is in a ministry that is close to the fivefold should do in response to understanding these truths. But remember, among other things, we told you don't ever create drama in a place. If you have to leave a place on principle that they've rejected a key provision of scripture, please make sure that there is no drama. The Lord will never approve you if you shake his church yourself. If you go to create a raucous confusion, there are some young ministers, they may not know why you are living. So make sure that whatever you're doing, you do it in such a way that it is gracious, no offense no anger, no nothing, strife. The Lord doesn't approve strife. Number three, please share your feedback. You know, you know, just let us have an idea. This course, how useful has it been for you? 
How has it opened your eyes? What and what things are you picking from it? And you know what? By the grace of the Father, we're going to lesson 37 next. And we'll keep building up to see what the Lord is saying to us at this time. The Lord loves us and he wants us all to receive victory and walk in victory so that this church is perfected, ready for his return. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity to get into this conversation and to continue in it, O oh Lord. Have your way. Glorify Yeshua. Let your word that has gone forth bear fruit, 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold, that all honor and glory be ascribed to you, Father. In Yeshua Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Thank you so much for being with us on this program and watching and we believe you learned something and the Lord bless you. Now it's time to connect with us on our social media platforms. We have a daily live stream on Facebook Monday all the way to Sunday every day by about 10.30 a.m. UK time and that's the same at Nigerian time and you, it's either Apostle George Monday to Friday uh, to Thursday, Pastor Grace uh, Friday to Sunday and then in the evening of Sunday we have two sessions from 5.30 to about 6 after 6 another one up to 7 so please join us on the live stream and you're going to enjoy it. We also visit our website www.gsom.ac to download free ebooks. This course you just listened to, all these lessons, you know, there's an ebook we have free of charge. Everything we do is free. But more importantly, you can actually do your program on, you know, ebooks. You can do your program entirely on ebooks and with this video or anyone you want you can also if you want to do the yes course or be, do the master class you can go to www.kingdombooksclub.com and you can subscribe so that you can do it you can also subscribe to our channels this youtube gsom.tv and we also have a telegram channel gsom media you can send us an email at akclife.tv at gmail.com we love you dearly and we want to partner with you to make sure that the body of Yeshua, Jesus, is empowered with truth. Remember, it is the teach, train, equip, activate, and release paradigm. Absolutely free of charge. Have a blessed day and we'll see you again soon.